Thank you very much. That is a surprising number of people, and John T was not joking about the spiders. Um, hi, I'm here to talk to you about hacking train tickets. I have 72 slides to get through, so it's going to be quick. Um, I am a site reliability engineer at Worth. Um, we're hiring. I also help out at these events, as was alluded to. Um, come to MCH22 as well in uh, the Netherlands. It's going to be awesome. Um, so why am I here? Uh, back in 2016, the BBC ran an article about people making copies of train tickets. Uh, this was really interesting to me, especially this specific paragraph, which says they couldn't write the mag stripe. Now, obviously, anyone with a thermal printer can you know, make a, and Photoshop can make the uh, front of a train ticket and make it look real, but if you can't make it go through the gate line, is it really a ticket? Um, so I asked TFL, who were the only public body you could FOI about this stuff, what's on the mag stripe? Um, they said they wouldn't tell me. So there had to be another way to find out. Uh, so for the agenda, we're going to take a brief detour, maybe not brief, through some historical stuff from the National Archives, because that is literally the only way to find out about some of this stuff. Um, we'll talk a bit about the data layout and how you read a ticket, um, and then very briefly, if we get to the end, about digital ticketing um, and stuff like that. Um, some things you don't want to learn more about. These are bad. Um, yeah, don't do them. Uh, and just for clarity, I don't have enough time to be comprehensive, so uh, I'm sorry if I miss something out um, or make a mistake. Um, this is purely research. Please don't go and hack train tickets cause, and put them through barriers because that would be bad. And the opinions are obviously only mine. Um, so some history. For those of you from not from the UK, um, you'll probably want to know a bit more about the weird train system that we have here. Um, so back in like the 19th century, it was private. Then it was public. Then it was private again. Um, and now it's maybe public again. Um, this means the specification for tickets kind of changes through different organizations, it belongs to different people, and it's changed throughout the years. Um, no one specification has really belonged to one organization at any one time, um, and it can often be very difficult to find out um, exactly what was uh, going on at any, any particular time. So, Back in the 60s, uh, we had these. These were Ed called Edmondson tickets. They were invented in the Victorian era. Um, they are, you would go to a station and buy them. They would have like a massive rack of them. Um, they were serial numbered, um, but they were pre-printed. Um, you could buy a ticket from a place to a place. Uh, they had any sort of bookkeeping was all in manual ledgers. It was all written down and then sent to a head office who would work out who had sold what. Um, they were very basic. Uh, British Rail did update them a bit, so they looked a bit fancier. Um, I'm not sure they really were very much fancier, but there you go. Um, but then we started to get, like in the 60s and 70s, we, went to, we invented things like computers, um, and better mechanical computers specifically. Um, so they started to issue these. Now these are machine-issued tickets. Um, they were, very, as I say, sort of very mechanical machines. Uh, so you would not encode anything on them, really, you know, no, nothing, nothing machine readable. Um, it would just be printing stuff. Um, there was no, again, no real tabulation um, other than manual ledgers. Um, and there were a lot of them. Every region had a different type of machine. Um, so we had some, some that looked like this, and some more that looked like this. Um, these are actually made by NCR, National Cash Registers who uh, still exist today. Um, this obviously created a problem. Um, by the 80s, these machines that were making these tickets were really unreliable. No one knew how to maintain them. The manufacturers didn't want to maintain them. So British Rail had to find another way to, to make tickets. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to. Um, and you can see here um, the number of different ticket machines that they had. Um, so, you know, different manufacturers, most of them not in support by this point. Um, this, is, this document is from the, from the 80s. And most of them are like, falling to pieces. Uh, so British Rail came up with something called INTIS. So INTIS is the Intermediate Ticketing Issuing, ticket issuing System. Not a huge amount is known about it because it didn't exist for very long, but it does resemble the ticket that you would buy today. So this is an INTIS ticket. Um, the very interesting thing about it is the, what's called the NLC, the National 
uh, I think it's national location code. So that's the numeric value. So 8355 re represents South Emsall, and 8591 represents Wakefield West. So these are not like CRS codes, like RDG or um, you know, London Terminals, LON. These are for mainly for accountancy purposes um, and represent a, a basically an office. Uh, so you can see at this point we do have, you know, the, some kind of uh, accountancy going on, some, some actual tracking within a ledger from a machine. Um, they're actually tape driven, so they would write out onto a, a, a tape, tape deck which would get posted on um, and would give them back in the, in the head office some idea of which office had sold how many tickets to where, uh, which was a really big thing because before this was like completely manual. Um, this is what it looks like in the ticketing manual in the National Archives. Um, slightly different style of ticket, um, but very similar thing. Um, but this is Intis, so it's intermediate. Um, it wasn't designed to be a permanent solution. It didn't even, it didn't have max right, but it didn't really do all the things they wanted it to. They still had to mail tapes backwards and forwards. Um, it had a very limited amount of things it could do. So they had to come up with something else. Um, obviously, you know, more specifications. That's definitely what we need. Um, so they came up with something called Aptis um, and Portis, which is the portable version. So Aptis was basically an evolution of Intis. So Aptis looks very similar, which we'll see in a moment. Um, it was designed to do basically everything. So you would be able to go to a station and buy a ticket from British Rail, an Aptis ticket, and it would have uh, the, the ticket machine would be able to record that they had sold it to you, that uh, you had bought it. Um, and it would encode all the information they needed on it, not on the max right, um, on the front of the ticket so they could do ticket checking and all that kind of stuff. Um, so an Aptis ticket looks like this, um, which is the type of ticket you see today. So this is back in the, back in the 80s. Um, yeah, uh, they, as I said, they do look very similar. So a comparison side by side. Uh, One's a travel card, one's a sort of British air, rarely a ticket. And they also did sort of variations, um, which are sort of side notes. So uh, this one does have a mag stripe, but um, yeah, they, they, you could buy like rail cards and stuff, um, which would all be printed on Aptis um, tickets. Uh, so it was really was like the, the new ticket system for British Rail. Um, British Rail came up with some future requirements for it. So the main one was that um, if you look at 7.1.2, um, that they wanted to be able to um, issue uh, uh, or read credit cards. Uh, that wasn't a thing they'd been able to do before. Aptis was supposed to help them with that. Um, and they also, in 7.1.1, wanted to be able to encode mag mag magnetic stripe data on the back of the tickets um, for some reasons. Um, it was, at the time, perceived to be an anti-fraud measure, basically. Um, in the 80s, people were starting to get uh, printers, dot matrix, that you could print tickets with. Uh, not dissimilar to the people in 2016 printing tickets um, that they had made on a, a thermal printer. Uh, and British Rail were worried that people would print their own tickets and not pay for them. Um, and there was also a sort of uh, legal thing about it as well. But it wasn't the only reason, because at that time, London Underground wanted to issue MagStripe tickets. And so, for political reasons, which aren't really specified, um, British Rail had to basically implement the London Underground specification for these. Um, and that really drives a lot of the data layout, I think, that we see on the tickets today. Um, one of the very interesting things is that um, British Rail actually got London Transport to pay for the upgrade to Aptis. Um, so, bigger processing power, bigger memory for their machines, um, they had to change the um, printer to do to print like different characters and stuff. Um, British Rail managed to get London Transport to pay for that, uh, which I think is very ingenious of them. Um, but it does mean that we get a specification for some of the mag stripe. So this is actually a really important document um, because this tells us uh, exactly how the mag stripe data, well, not how it is laid out, but what type of mag stripe it is. Um, so. As you may be aware, it is a single-track mag stripe. Uh, that's not very common. 
you won't see it outside many transport um, applications. Um, even the New York Metro uses um, side-aligned um, tickets, um, and that means that it's really, really difficult to read. It's also not any ISO standard. It was invented in the 80s to a weird other specification that no one really knows about, um, and as a consequence, this is really difficult to read. Um, from this document, we can deduce the data layout. So we have a 16-bit header at the front and a 16-bit footer at the back. In between, we have 152 bits of stuff and some kind of checksum. Uh, I don't know how to compute the checksum. Uh, that's something we can look at working out at some point in the future. Um, this is what the header should look like. So you should have uh, a load of zeros at the beginning and then 1010 uh, to tell you that it's uh, forward direction and then reverse direction. So if you feed the ticket in the wrong way, um, it knows it's reading it backwards. You should get a load of zeros and then uh, four ones. Uh, this is actually really, really useful uh, because it means that when we're trying to read the tickets, we can actually work out if we're reading something that looks like valid data or whether we're just reading a mistake, uh, which turns out is most of uh, what I spent my time doing. Um, so reading and writing it, these is really hard. Uh, back in 2017, I did try to do this uh, with a standard MagStripe reader writer you can buy on the internet. Doesn't work, you get garbage. They expect ISO standard credit cards, they expect it to be sidetracked. Um, they do not, they can't read these. It's just not what they're designed to do. Um, and as a result, you get like, like complete garbage data that doesn't mean anything. There was a talk a while ago um, I think in 2005 at CCC, uh, which was about the New York Metro and reading stuff like that, uh, reading the data off that and reverse engineering it. Um, back then they suggested that this method of doing it, so um, having a jack and basically reading the audio uh, through that and then writing the software to decode that. I thought that was a bit too difficult, so I decided to go for an alternative approach. Um, this is a ticket printer, the ND402020. It's made by Newbury Data. Um, it prints tickets. Um, it also magnetically encodes them, uh, and they are fairly common. You will, certainly in the early days of privatization, you would have come across one um, as Aptis died out and they started replacing Aptis uh, with new systems. Um, these were one of the very common machines that we used. Um, they are actually designed to have a whole sort of hopper system on the back, so you can feed like huge amounts of tickets through them uh, for things like posting them out to you. So if you want, don't want to collect them at the station and get them posted to you, um, they have a sort of whole automated thing that you can set up with this. Um, but the most interesting thing is you can buy these on eBay. Um, yes, uh, they're quite expensive. Uh, so you can see a bit what it looks like. Um, the bit at the top is where the tickets go in. They sit. Um, well, they sit like along the top of that. There's a whole bit above this that isn't here, and they will fall down and get uh, pulled through to the front. So the ticket path is usually down and out, but as I mentioned, they do have the facility to have a whole sort of hopper system at the back, so they can actually be fed straight through, uh, which is what I was doing um, later on. Uh, yeah, comes with a lot of electronics. But. So this is what the electronics actually looks like. Uh, there's some ROM chips on there. Uh, they are surface mount. Reading them is a pain. Uh, don't try that. Um, but what we can try and do, because it has RST32, is try and talk to it via serial. So it turns out this is actually quite difficult because, again, like tickets, it's not publicly documented. Um, it does, after a lot of trying, thank you, our lab. Uh, for letting me sit there for a long time and all the various people that helped me. Um, you eventually can get it to my uh, fiddling with some pins on the board and flicking the power switch enough times, you can get it to give you some serial. Um, so that's what a serial connection looks like to it. It is just um, RSC32, the board rates uh, 15200, I think, and maybe I'm missing a zero. Um, and you can talk to it. Um, it has a serial interface, you can send it data, and it will send you data back, like this. Uh, I don't know how legible that is, sorry. Um, so it has a whole menu thing, you can even set the time. Um, it doesn't have a backup battery, so if you unplug it, it will forget the time. Uh, I don't know why it needs a timestamp, it doesn't really use it as far as I know. 
Um, the interesting thing is it has quite a lot of onboard storage. So it has a whole facility for you to be able to write data into memory locations and then read it back. This is a kind of a weird feature because it's not really how I would expect something like this to work. I'm sure there's some very good reasons it's designed like this, and I'm sure there are some excellent drivers for it. I did try and decompile some software that works with it, but I couldn't find anything useful because I'm not very good with assembly. So, yeah. Um, this is what the data bank looks like um, before I overwrote it with uh, ones, because obviously. Um, you can specify a register and get it to pull data back for you. The other thing you can do is tell it where you want to execute. So you can give it a memory address, and it will then ask you some details about that function. But, or it, it assumes it's a function. So you can say, I want to execute something. Does the function return the value? Yes. How many parameters does it have? I don't know. Zero. Um, and then hopefully it will execute it. Well, no. It actually just resets. So this is when it kind of got a bit boring, because without any manual for this, without any idea how to interface with the serial stuff, how to even generate data for it, because uh, it's not just feeding it binary, but it has to print stuff as well, remember. So don't know how to do that. So gave up, but this is probably how it works uh, from a bit of Googling. Um, it probably uses Pectab. In fact, it does most definitely use Pectab, which is a way of defining a layout. It's most commonly used for airline tickets and baggage tags. Apparently, it's also used for train tickets. No idea how that works. Um, if someone would like to tell me, I'd love to know. Um, you load that with some ticket parameters, stick it into the printer, and then press execute, and it prints out a ticket, is the theory. As I say, don't really know, because I went for the alternative approach, which was taking it to pieces and putting it on the oscilloscope. The, it actually takes 24 volts DC um, in, as I discovered um, after blowing one of them up, but we'll get to that. Um, and you can drive the motors separately. It's actually really quite well engineered. Um, if you want to come and have a look at it later, you can. Um, it's got geared motors and everything. So you can just drive the motors through the ticket path and put tickets through it. And then, because it has a magstrike uh, reader on it, so it can read the tickets it writes, because quality, you actually want to verify that you've written correct data to the ticket. Um, you can then interface with that and pull data off it. So this is what it looks like when you run a ticket through it. So the yellow line is a clock line. Um, the blue line is a data line. So if we remember the um, data spec from before, the MagStripe spec, it does mention clock sync bytes. Um, so this is why they exist, so that you have enough time to sync your clock, uh, or, well, not sync your clock, to do you have enough clock bytes to align with the data that you're going to start coming through. Um, so this actually took quite a while of fiddling around with different settings to try and get it to actually do this. You do actually need to feed it with power and then power the motor separately in order to get this because it does some weird voltages with the MagStrike re uh, reader. Um, the easiest thing is just to feed it power, uh, which turns the MagStrike reader on, and then power the motor separately, um, put the ticket through, and you get data on the scope. Um, but that's not Im immensely useful because I can't read binary from um, a trace on scope. But luckily, you can do scope captures. There is some open source software for Regal scopes and you can pull a CSV of the trace that you have on there, amongst other things. Um, this means you get data like this. Now, as you might be aware, you have a rising edge and a falling edge. So you need to, in order to know when you have data, you need to detect the rising edge on both the clock and the data lines. And then that's a one if you get a, and it's actually falling edge. Um, it's, uh, it pulls the line low when it's um, activating it. So you actually, you're detecting a, a falling edge on both of them for one and a falling edge on just the clock for zero. Um, and this is quite difficult to do with the data that comes out of the scope capture because it's not really designed for that as far as I can make out. And there's no way to alter the resolution and all that kind of stuff. So you end up with data that looks like that, which is not what we expected. Um, this is also when I blew up one of them. Uh, it turns out that 
AC is not DC, and 230 volts is not 24 volts. Um, who knew? Um, it, it blew the track right off the board as well. Um, it was quite impressive. Um, so it was expensive, another 100 quid to eBay one and a half weeks ago. Um, yes, I like cutting it fine with my talks. Um, and we have another board. So this one, excitingly, has ROMs that you can pull off. Um, it's an earlier revision, it has a bodge wire on the back, but we can do a very similar thing. We can plug it into the scope, uh, we can plug it, uh, we can power the motor, and we can put a ticket through. Except this time, um, you can see there's a circuit playground, I think it's called. Um, I blew up my, uh, one of my uh, microcontrollers in the 230 volt e episode, so I have to borrow one. Thank you to the person that got me that. Um, to do the uh, voltage comparison on some hardware. So instead of having to pull something off the scope, we can just write some Python and we can get some data back, which looks like this. So this is a bit more what we want to see. You can see in bold, we have some zeros and then we have a one, zero, zero, one. And then, and then at the end, we have four ones and then we have a load of zeros. That's the kind of data we're expecting to see. So when you start putting loads of tickets through, you eventually get a load of binary that looks pretty similar. And this is truncated, it's the first something bytes of a load of travel cards, and you can see the data looks really, really similar, which is good, because that's what we would expect. There are various bits at the end that don't look similar, but data looks pretty similar, except for the uh, 17th of February, which you can see is like offset a bit, so something's gone a bit wrong. Uh, so it's actually really easy to see ones that don't look like, don't look correct um, just by eye, um, and we can remove it. Now, these are all travel cards, they all look the same, which is not particularly useful. Um, when we're trying to reverse engineer the specification and understand where data, is, uh, where data sits in the magstripe, we want to compare different types of tickets. So here are some other tickets, so we have uh, Reading, the, the, the top ones are Reading travel cards. Then we have a Reading to Hook, which is somewhere in Berkshire, and Hook to Reading. Um, and the interesting thing is you can see the substring is repeated. So the one 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 zero zero one zero zero one zero one zero one is repeated, but in a different place on the Hook to Reading. So we can make a pretty good guess, since it doesn't repeat anywhere else in that string, I checked, um, that that indicates Reading. And when you move it, uh, because it's also in the travel cards, remember? So when we move it to the, uh, in the uh, return portion, we can see that it's moved, uh, it's moved to the sort of further down the mag stripe. Uh, so we've now identified fairly, fairly well the ar arrival and departure station uh, indication on the mag stripe just by looking at it. Um, and we can validate that by adding another ticket. So this is um, Oxford to Reading. Uh, and, uh, sorry, yeah, Oxford to Reading, and you can see again that the return um, portion has the, the substring in that, that same position that we would expect. So that's really good. We can read data from it, we can make some kind of interpretation about what it looks like um, and what it means. Um, the other thing that we can do is identify other things in this, so you can see there that we have the um, arrive at the hook station code. Um, so again, it kind of works both ways. We can validate that we are actually making an inference about something that is, that is correct. So the hook, hook go, moves from the beginning of the mag stripe to the end of the mag stripe um, in the portion from Reading to Hook, and Reading moves from the front of the mag stripe to the end of the mag stripe when you're going from Hook to Reading. That's what we expect. So how, what does this actually mean? So I don't know. These are the NLCs at the end in bold. So Reading is 3149. Um, the beginning of it I, does not match the NLC. I don't know how these are encoded, but they, they seem to be, there seems to be some kind of pattern. The, the way that you would find this out is basically by putting more, putting more mag stripe tickets through the machine and recording loads more data. But if we take a zoomed out view, we can also identify other patterns in the data. So the top block of these are the travel cards you saw before. The bottom block aren't. And 
you can see that um, just above the block shaded green, there's a load of data in the travel cards. And this appears to indicate that that's where you specify a travel card for TFL. Um, and obviously, that's not present on tickets that don't uh, have their travel card, because they're not a travel card. So they don't have any data there. Good, that's what we expect to see. And then you can see uh, in the red section, that's the uh, one and then uh, two, uh, that there is some data there. And those are tickets which are via London. So a ticket where you're going from Reading to Leeds or something via London, and you need to use the tube to go through from one terminal station to another. So. Again, we're seeing data where we expect to see it. Um, it looks correct. Um, and we can begin to sort of deduce, uh, by putting more and more tickets through, uh, exactly what uh, this, this could be and what the bits could actually mean. Um, I have about a minute left, I think. Um, but just to sort of sum up, so this is not encrypted. Uh, we can see that because we get reliable data when you put multiple tickets through. They all look. They do the same. We can see patterns by eye, which is really good. Um, it's not hugely obscure either. Um, you can buy one of these on eBay and do the same thing. Um, but you can't really do it with any other equipment. Um, I think if you want to do it manually, you could do it sort of the old school method by running some reader over it. But I can't guarantee that will work because it is a really weird max right? Um, there is also a checksum. We don't know how to calculate the checksum. So it's going to be pretty difficult to write a ticket that's going to be accepted by a barrier, and you shouldn't put it through a barrier to check, because that would not be legal, I understand. So um, pattern matching is doable. Um, and if you have a corpus of ticket data, you would be able to do that. Um, I think one of the things that probably shouldn't be the case is that you can buy these on eBay. Um, I'm not sure that's intended the intended uh, electronic waste disposal method for them, but um, it seems to be where they're going right now. I think it might become a bit of a problem because um, as soon as you um, manage to crack these, get you know, work out exactly what's on the tickets, and you can buy one of these machines, you can probably just write your own. Um, where is it going next? Um, as, as I say, collecting a lot of ticket data. If you collect enough data, you'll be able to do some alignment and work out exactly what stuff does. Uh, one of the ideas is using BLAST or BLAST or FASTA. These are the bioinformatics tools usually used for aligning protein strands. Um, they can possibly be hacked to align ticket data strands um, with enough um, energy and time. Uh, that could be quite an interesting thing because you get substrings that match, and then you want to see the differences between between tickets, so you're basically determining like, the best alignment, which is what BLAST is for. Um, the other interesting thing would be to dump the ROMs and also try writing via this machine, which I don't know how hard that is, because I didn't try it. I don't have much time to talk about it's so an e-ticket, um, other than to say um, they're much better. Um, and just to sort of finish off, um, this is very much security by obscurity. I'm already going with like a few tickets and a week. Um, <laughs> pulling quite a lot of interesting data off. If anyone wants to send me more tickets to put through, that would be really helpful. Um, because with enough tickets, you will be able to reverse engineer this. Um, some of the assumptions that were made about how MagStrike would be used, I don't think are true anymore, especially when you can buy these on eBay. And it is only going to be a matter of time before someone is writing their own and has worked out how to calculate that checksum. So really, we need digital tickets now, not in several years, um, because I don't think it's going to be too long before the fraudsters have upped their game and can write the mag stripe as well as print the tickets. I hope that was useful. Um, and that is it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be outside.